Hi, I'm Ross Cameron, and this is my podcast where we'll explore everything related to day trading. You'll hear me recap trades, analyze strategy, dive into trading psychology, and interview other traders. I'll share with you the biggest ups and the biggest downs of being a trader, and you'll pick up tips and tricks along the way that you won't hear anywhere else. If you love what you hear and you wanna keep learning, you can check out more free content over on my YouTube channel or visit warriortrading.com to see my premium members-only chat rooms, scanners, and trading courses. I wanna remind you, as always, that trading is risky and my results and experiences as a trader are not typical. There's no guarantee that you'll find success, whether you trade on your own or you learn from me. So please, take it slow and practice in a simulator before you put real money on the line. And remember, these episodes are for educational purposes only and are not financial advice or buy-sell recommendations. So let's go ahead and jump in to this episode. In today's episode, I'll be interviewing Max. He's the most recent student at Warrior Trading to cross over $1 million in verified profits. We are super proud of him. I'm really excited to interview him. And as always, when I interview profitable traders, I'm gonna be asking him questions about his learning curve. What were his turning points? And of course, we'll talk about his strategy. So as an aspiring trader, these are awesome sessions to tune into. And one of the things that I did after interviewing a number of traders who had made over million dollars. Uh, Max is uh, the 10th trader at Warrior Trading, the 10th student to make over a million dollars. After interviewing all these traders, I decided to write a blog because what I noticed was that a lot of these traders had very similar characteristics, both in strategy and in mindset. And so I wanted to try to articulate these and condense them all into a, a brief podcast. There's a link in the bottom of this uh, description for the podcast where you can check out the All-Star Traders page over at Warrior Trading. So after you listen to this interview, I hope you're inspired, I hope you're excited, I hope you check out that All-Star uh, Traders page. And as again, as always, I have to remind you that Max's results are not typical and there is no guarantee that you will find similar results because trading is in fact risky. So please take it slow, but if you're here to learn, you wanna study, let's go ahead and jump in to today's interview with Max. All right, everyone. Well, um, I am excited here because I'm going to sit down and uh, talk with Max. He is the newest member of the Warrior community who has gotten his $1 million badge, over a million dollars of profit from trading. So this is an opportunity for us to sit down and talk to you and hear a little bit about your experience, your strategy, your turning point, and then we'll talk about some of the nitty gritty things, what platform he uses, broker, um, order routing, what kind of tools he's using. I'll you know, ask some questions around that stuff. And um, then we'll give um, hopefully some inspiration to beginner traders out there. And uh, maybe there'll be a few really good pieces of um, advice, good takeaways from what he's gone through in his journey. This is always is meant to inspire you, not for you to think that his result or mine are typical. We don't track the typical result traders in our community, so we can't say that you're any more or less likely to succeed. But I hope this inspires you. I hope you find it interesting. And um, let's go ahead and jump in. So Max, welcome. Thank you. Thank I'm, you. I'm so proud Thanks, of you, man. It's good to be here. You've Thank done it. You. That's awesome. Yeah. Felt like a long time coming, but super excited to be here. So how long have you been uh, how long have you been trading this is the first time we've ever talked so for those tuning in just so you know I've we've never talked before so you, you're we're learning at the same time about max yeah so the first time that I started really taking up trading you know it was kind of similar to a lot of others where it was just Robin Hood you know investing in stocks for overnight whatever it might be but that never found success in that okay um, but I followed back up after one of my friends actually got back into it um, and I started learning more about it and, and just patterns and strategies and all that. So it was February of 2020, right before the pandemic, right before the market crash and everything like that. Yeah. Um, so I was able to learn a, a good bit from it. Um, at first I was really just trying to find anything, any um, education at all, but found you Ross and ever since it was just a lot easier to succeed, a lot easier to, to learn, but. Good. Now, what is your, um... What's your what's your primary strategy? If if you were going to summarize, you, you know, you didn't think I knew anything about trading. What what would you tell me your strategy is? How do you trade? Um, so I'm just like you, Ross. I'm, I'm Momo, or so I I just find high day stocks that are continue higher. Um, Max, what does Momo mean? Momentum, momentum, Ross. 
Okay. Um, but I'll look for momentum stocks or, or leading gappers each day. Yeah. Um, and through that, I'll look for dips, micro dips, any other kind of dips. I really like to take um, dip trades through that. Um, my favorite tip, my, my favorite kind of uh, trade actually is taking a dip trade off of support, um, holding that up to a break of high day, adding into it, and then taking profit after. You'll sometimes find bottoming tails. Um, and shorts obviously don't like bottoming tails. If I yep. ever see a bottoming tail, I'm all over it. Um, yep. And that'll also give it just through the high day that much more go um, and get that much more of a squeeze too. So. so for those tuning in, you know, the bottoming tail, this is something we talk about a lot and I'll just, I'll draw it for you here. So um, when we have a stock that's pulling back, so we'll have, you know, this big green candle right here. And then we have a maybe micro pullback kind of forming right here. And then you have this candle that opens, it sells off here and then immediately reverses and comes back up. That's a lower candle wick. And when it closes green like that, that is a bottoming tail. And it's super bullish because even though it's bearish that it sold off, the bulls bought it right back up and it closes strong. And I can create a, a bear trap. And, you know, as my son was asking the other day, Dad, Dad what's a bear trap? And I said, son, bears aren't very smart they fall into the bear trap and that's how we catch bear meat so when you have a stock that flushes like that it looks like it's rolling over it looks like it's dead and then it comes right back up and then what you have is double buying you have buying short cover and you have buying long momo traders double buying double volume bigger breakout so th this is all about the language of the market and, and you're able to visualize that language through you know through the chart pattern and, and through the ultimately even sometimes individual candlesticks what are you using for your charts are you on um a broker for charts or are you doing it yeah i'm on thinkorswim so through td okay so. yeah so td charts that's good and are you using td for order execution also yeah i did yep. try lightspeed at 1.2 for pre-market because i couldn't really figure out um, right thinkorswim for pre-market which is the best situation but at the same time though i didn't find it to be all that useful it just i struggled with it so i, I went back to think so. yeah yeah okay all right that makes sense uh, no, no piano playing <laughs> my son's looking at the piano hi um it's just like the it's just not a great time to play the piano he's like it's just gonna be too loud um so that's interesting on think or swim um we'll we'll come back to that in a second so but in terms of strategy, tell me how you find stocks to trade. Um, so each morning I'll look at the leading gappers that um, your, your scanners find me. Um, I'll oftentimes look at the biggest gapper, of course, most volume. I don't really like stocks over $30. Um, I've kind of tried to go into large caps at certain points too, and small caps are kind of dead, but mm -hmm. not my not my strong suit in there. Um, but. Yeah, I'll really just look for leading gappers or sometimes continuation from the last day. I'll look for daily setups sometimes too, very occasionally. Um, stuff that's just super sold off. I don't mm -hmm. swing really, but just really just look for daily setups or leading gappers is the main strategy. So since you're with TD Ameritrade, how much are you relying and using level two? Do you use the level two or do you use the latter? Um, I use level two um, pretty much entirely. I'll have okay. the active trader. That's where the ladder is. Yep. Um, it's really just the order execution window, whatever you want to call it. Yep. But um, I, I rely solely on hot keys though too. Um, awesome. And unlike a lot of others, um, unless it's free market, I will only buy and sell um, with market. So like going to market, not limit orders. Mm -hmm. So it's a little different, but. Yeah. Um, well, I, you so know, honestly, so what's kind of interesting here is that that's what a lot of traders who are with TD Ameritrade use because it's the easiest within the platform so you've mm -hmm. kind of adapted your strategy to fit the tool you're using which um you know is is fine it works there's some you know there's some argument um that you can have between market and, and limit orders um, i use marketable limit orders so mm -hmm. if the ask is four i put a limit of 410 so essentially it performs and functions as a market order unless the stock rips to 450 in which case mm -hmm. i might only fill a couple shares or none and i generally think that's better than filling at 450 which is what a market order would ultimately do do you ever have yeah. that happen or not too bad yeah yeah there's certain times where it goes from up that jump of 50 cents where there's just no other sellers in that area um so there's certain times that i will get filled 
much higher than where I want it to be filled. But right. um, at the same time, it's sometimes it can also kind of bless me in a way where I'm actually selling as that happens. Oh. Um, where I, I mean, there's sometimes sure. I'll, where I'll make mistakes though, and it, it'll just yeah you know, go without me, and then I get filled up. Yeah. A lot well, higher than where yeah, but no, you're right. I mean, there there's times you, you probably catch both sides at, at, at various points. There's times where you right. feel bad on the buy side. There's times where you feel bad on the sell side. But there's times you get the sort of just great fill on one side or the other. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, so your process of finding stocks to trade, you're using the gap scanners, you're looking for the top two sort of leading gappers, you're avoiding stocks over 30. You don't care as much about float as long as it's obvious, but probably low float, you know, is are the oh, ones yeah. that can be more crazy. Um, sure. You are using hotkeys, you're using market orders during regular trading hours. Pre-market, you're using, is it just the, the ladder or you're using buy ask? I'll do um, buy, ask, and sell bid and stuff like that. It's still okay. hot heats and all that. I'll just switch the time and force to extended hours rather than um, day. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, and I mean the other thing with the market order is you're never going to be you're never going to fill on the ask, right? Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the the punishment with with marketable orders. The way the way I kind of feel about it is when I want to get in something really quick, I'm going to buy basically market and I'll pay the extra price of the spread to get in right now because i'm not going to be patient and sit and wait on the bid on a stock that's breaking out mm. but if i'm in and i have a good position I, have you tried clicking join ask during regular trading hours to see how it fills i actually i i did a while ago now the share size i'm taking now um, yeah so i'll buy in 2000 share blocks too because it'll it'll yep. fill a lot faster than say I take 10,000 shares rather than just filling one order i'll press right. it five times rather than that um but I haven't tried that for a while though, so I'm not not really sure on the joining the bid or ask. Interesting. When I was using TD, I was um, buying ask and I was trying to join the ask to sell at the ask price. That way, at least I could be a little patient on the other side of the order, and then that mm -hmm. kind of recoups the loss of the spread that I got from the beginning, right? I buy cool. ask, but then if I sell ask, then I'm I'm kind of evens out for me. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, yeah, so then, uh, and then you've got the hotkeys and then you've got the micro pullbacks that you're focusing on. And what hours do you usually trade? Um, I, I tend to make the most profit between like 8.30 or, sorry, I'm from Illinois. So 8.30, um, 9.30, right when the market opens, I'll, I'll make the most of them then um, about two hours past them too at about 10.30 or so. But um, awesome. when, I, when I tend to stay longer, I tend to give back, I tend to ruin yeah. my days and yeah, this it's just a cycle so i really try and stick between those two hours though and try and be done at that point good so then what do you do for the rest of the day whatever i want that's the beauty of trading nice that's but, cool um now unfortunately though I'll, I'll still always watch charts though sometimes i'll put up alerts um okay i'll always have an eye on everything that's going on okay uh, especially in a market like right now um yeah in, in the beginning of june where it's just super slow i, I really want to I, I have a lot of FOMO. I don't want to miss that one that's going on right now. And I don't know. I, I I sort of have this rule that I'm not always good at following, which is when I'm done, don't go back and don't keep looking. Because yeah. then what ends up happening is if I come back at two and I miss this big move from 11 to one, then I can't change the fact that I missed it, but I tend to sort of overcompensate. And then, you know, with my luck, it'll be, you know, crap from two to four. Yep. And then I end up losing the gains I made on the morning and I still miss that opportunity. And then I'm just agitated, frustrated. And it's really easy to carry that then into the next day. And totally. it feels like if you're that trading that one of... stock in the morning too, um, right. it has a certain price action. You go back later though, and it's just a lot more whippy, sometimes more choppy, yeah. sometimes not, but yeah, it, it, it just trades differently too at certain points. Sure. Point sure. Time points. Right. Not no, exactly. Yeah. And, and that's, that's where I feel sometimes like it's that FOMO, causes traders to lose sight of what they already have you know if and you know you it doesn't matter you could be up 200 you could be up 500 you could be up 5,000, and anyone any trader can say oh that's not enough when they see the stock they were trading go up another you know 200 percent without them but it's like you know what man like you made your money and you made more in that two hours this morning than most people probably make in a couple hours of work why isn't that enough? Why you why do you have to go back? Why do you have to let that FOMO get to you? Your your next best chance is to wait probably and hit it tomorrow, tomorrow morning during your your best time. And that's kind of that funny thing where the 
the, the 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 gain if you come back and take those trades and make money what you've gained is you know you've made some money but you sort of broke rules a little bit on discipline but if you lose not only do you lose money you have this mental kind of setback where now you you're you you're off your focus you're you gave into FOMO you're frustrated and that is almost worse to me than losing money because get when you get off your kind of a game that can start to snowball and i mean i've literally had days where i was in great shape and then at three in the afternoon i lost like 30 or 40 grand mm -hmm. and i'm like are you serious right now yeah what's wrong with me what do you do when you find yourself either you know you have a big red day or how how good are you at being able to kind of compartmentalize it just put it away and come back you know the next day with like a clean slate and not be revenge trading and kind of making all those mistakes sure. um, it really just depends on how big the loss was of course um i mean for my bigger losses my biggest one that was a really tough one to come up um come out after um but some of my other ones in there too just knowing that that red day was doable for a green day too where i can make that back easily in another green day um, it's a yeah. lot easier to think about it like that where it's just oh this will just take another two or three days to come out of, or if I have a really good day, I'll come right out of it. Um, so it's, right. that's true. It, it's really just thinking back to, and I mean, sometimes I'll even go back into trader view, look at my um, profit curve and just know that I'm successful, know that what I've done has gotten me where I'm at. Um, and just know that after that loss, it, it's just another, like you say, water under the bridge where it's really just yep. one step closer yep. to succeeding. That's one less loss that you'll have yep. in the long term. So that's how I like to think about it. That's good. That's good. I mean, the, the fact is everyone is going to have losses and mm -hmm. it's really your choice whether you're going to view that through the lens of negativity and I suck and, you know, this is terrible and I'll probably never make this back or I'm going to be depressed all day or mm -hmm. you choose and it takes strength to be able to not kind of fall into that rut. I think a lot of people will fall into that kind of, you know, self-loathing and type of rut very easily. It takes a certain amount of willpower to say, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to spend the rest of the day thinking about this, dwelling on it. This day will be water under the bridge a couple days from now. And since three days from now, I'm not going to care about it at all. I'm not going to waste any more time today being upset about this loss. Mm -hmm. But of course, that's easier to say when you're able to manage your losses to not be too much more than you would make in one good day sure. um, or too much more than you might make on one good trade. I, you know, my, my biggest loss this year is twice my biggest winner this year. So, you know, that's, that's not great. My biggest yeah. red day uh, this year, it, I don't think it's, it's not as big as my biggest green day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, so that's good, I guess. But yeah. uh, you know, if I took a $30,000 loss today, I wouldn't be likely that I'd make it back tomorrow because the market's just so cold right now. Yeah, it would probably definitely. take a week or you know maybe two weeks to make that back. So sure. you know that's certainly um, you know it's it's good to be thinking about risk a little bit with what's the market that we're in and you know yeah. can I real how much do I really want to potentially draw down today? Because yeah. you know if you're having a day where you're red on four out of five stocks you know, or whatever. It's like, this just, everything is telling me this isn't the day to push it. And now it's my choice of whether I'm going to listen to those signals. Because while the chart patterns may not be communicating that, your P&L on the day can. If you're mm -hmm. red, when have you ever been red on four out of five or four out of six stocks and that was your best day ever? Like that doesn't happen. Yeah. You no, know what I mean? So when, so when you step up and try to swing hard on the six stock that comes up, you're really setting yourself up to potentially get wrecked. Yeah. The best yeah. days, usually we're green on all the stocks we trade on mm -hmm. the best days, right? Maybe it's two out of two or three out of three or four out of four stocks. I mean, I've had days where I've traded 10 or 15 stocks and I'm green on most of them. Mm -hmm. You know, those are the days where it makes sense to dig deep, put the pedal to the metal. You're seeing this sort of FOMO MOMO across the whole market. Everything is moving higher. That's the day to be aggressive. Not the day where you're red on the majority of stocks and everything that pops up runs right into a wall and then comes right back down. Yep. 
That's where you just those days and the days you get green early, you get a good profit cushion early. Um, stick within your parameters of whenever you're going to trade. Like you mm -hmm. said, you're not green pre market. If you haven't taken trade pre market, you're likely not to take a trade that day, too. Yeah. Um, it's also another thing to think about, too. Something I was um, noting earlier this, or maybe it was end of last week, I was looking at my metrics and I've had. I've had two really, really good days this year. And, you know, we're we're like 40% through the year right now. I mean, we're almost halfway through the year by the end of this month. So I was like, should I be trading the rest of this year? Hope, you know, trying each day, hoping that it'll be one of maybe the two days in the second half of the year that are that good? Or should I focus on the 125 other days, which, you know, statistically will probably just be small base hits but if and i think for me this is a big one for the rest of this year if i can keep my losses smaller i'm going to finish much better the second half than i've done in the first half the first half i've been churning a lot i've let losses get too big because i try to scale up for that big move and then it rejects and rather than just being grateful for the you know smaller gains of two to three thousand a day which is totally respectable and is 750,000 a year potentially. Mm -hmm. I'm sizing up for this big move and then finishing down 10,000. And it happens again and again and again in a cold market. And I'm trying to just stop thinking about hitting, you know, 30, 40, 50, 75,000, 100,000 dollar green days because it isn't happening right now and every time I try swing for it, I feel like I'm striking out. I mean, literally, I've only had two days where I was, I think, over $50,000 this year, which, you know, was awesome those two days, but we're already over 100 days into the trading year. So yeah. that's only 2% of my trading days. You can't yeah. focus all your attention on what has the likelihood of being only 2% of the time. What's happening the remaining 98% of the time? How are you trading? And if that whole time you're stretching and pushing yourself too hard and digging yourself holes and being sloppy, that's not good. I think, so that's kind of what I'm thinking about right now. Cause you know, we are in a bear market. And so, you know, the question is, um, it's not about really to me making a ton of money this year. I'm not going to set any records this year, trading small caps in a bear market, but can I keep my head above water? Can I stay green? And can I make a little bit? And can I improve my trading by being more disciplined? Cause if I could do those things, then I'm going to come out of this and into the next bull market really well equipped to thrive i'll only do better when things are hotter if i can be more disciplined yeah it's not going to hurt it's only mm -hmm. going to help yep similar to you and similar actually is that last um august i was actually read that month about twenty six thousand. that was my biggest loss uh, biggest red month that was that was tough yeah coming out of that too i mean talking about discipline too i focused a lot on just taking the a quality setups focusing on stocks that are only over vwap not really taking many dip trades, just yep. taking the most high profitability and just a couple trades a day and done get out. And that's yeah. Like I'm probably gonna have to go back to that pretty soon too. It's been a little bit of a struggle early yeah. or end of May, early June, but But those the also. thing is those days add up. Mm -hmm. Right? And oh, what yeah. what they do, not only do they add up when you have a stretch of five days, ten days like that, you get this big boost of confidence. Because you're mm -hmm. like, I'm back. This is this is what it feels like, and it, and that those small green days after five or ten of them in a row, that feels so much better than the big red days that you were having before. Yeah. So even though you might not make a ton in those small base hits, you feel so much better. You're like, thank mm -hmm. you. This it's reaffirming that I know what I'm doing. I'm back on track. I just need to stay focused on this. If I keep doing this, I'll recoup the losses that I dug being way too aggressive being stupid whatever and now i just need to stay focused and, and i feel like you know i'll stay super focused and then things start to get hot and you can start to get a little looser you can start having trades where you hold through a huge dip but the market's hot it does rip back up and then you know you kind of get into this expansion where things are so hot you're just really pushing it you're killing it and then you get caught you get spanked for being a little a little looser and then mm -hmm. that's the reminder and that's where you have to make that transition to going into a little bit of a colder market yeah. it's like okay that's the one that got me i need to go back to being disciplined and get really tight again 
and then recoup those losses and then start to you know expand out but you know sometimes I, I don't know traders have asked me sometimes Ross you know you've been trading for so long it feels like you're making it too complicated just trade the same same share size every day just always trade 15,000 shares just do the same like why mm. why do you try to like throttle up and throttle back and I'm like I'm like well you know there are some markets where I'm literally trying to push almost my like entire account into a trade because I'm like this is so hot yeah. I want to capitalize as much as I can on it mm -hmm. so I might go up to 35 45 50,000 shares or 100,000 shares whatever it is whatever I can afford because it's so hot and yet uh, and of course sometimes I'll be wrong and take a huge loss but enough times I've done that and I've been right and I've been like it was worth it and then there's other markets where it's like I don't even feel comfortable taking the full 10,000 shares. Yeah. So it, it feels like it would, I think that people like the idea of being able to automate a strategy, you know, just yeah. take the, take the guesswork out of it, take the, you know, make it easy and just do the exact same every day. Sure. And, and you know what, if you did that, you'd probably have a, a sort of a bit more flatter curve because you wouldn't have those expansions of those huge green days sure but then you wouldn't also have the drawdowns that you know come hand in hand mm -hmm. uh, so i don't know i mean at the end of the day maybe someone who trades like that would be much more emotionless in their trading and just like i'm coming in ten thousand in ten thousand out some days i i make more some days i make less but i feel mm -hmm. like it's you know this is just the human aspect of trading that when it's hot you try to get as much as you can and when it's cold you try to take shelter and ease off right yeah, definitely and just like jeff says too i mean cash is a position too so i mean i like to think about that too during a cold market um it definitely does help just knowing that if i don't trade it's better than losing um, or taking a huge share size though on a, on a similar pattern looking on a chart and losing big in a cold market that i can't make back very shortly right. um, like i wouldn't hot market so I think it's definitely important to size up and size down with the markets too, depending on whatever each person feels comfortable with, but yeah. especially in a cold market, I definitely think it is best to size down. Um, and if it's for me, sometimes I still have that mental blockage, I guess, of being able to do that really. Um, so what I'll do is I'll actually withdraw almost all of my accounts that I don't have much in there. Um, makes it a lot easier just because when I do click that buy button economy, I'm not it's able gone. to take 20,000 shares. And, and so. I'll do, I do the same thing. Um, I just cut my account in half uh, at the end of last week. I just, yeah. I was like, no, I, I just don't need the ability to swing big right now. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't taken a huge position in, I don't know how long it's been, a couple months. And I don't want the buying power to be able to do it because I'm afraid that for whatever reason, I'll have a day where I get a little, I get a little emotional. I get a little frustrated. Yeah. I get stubborn. And then I just... I got wrecked and yep. to just completely diffuse the situation, make it so I can't do that. The only way is to take the money out. You know, I, you, you can call your broker and have them set limits, but then you can also just call them and ha ask them to <laughs> increase those or take them off. So yeah. if the money's not there, it's not there. You can't, yeah. there's nothing you can do. So I think that's, that's a smart move. I've heard a lot of yeah. traders do that. And I, I think that that's a good cold market strategy. And you know, the, the, the thing is, what has stopped me from doing that at times in the past has been FOMO because it's been like, dude, the, the, the one day, you know, that GameStop is going to go crazy, you're not going to have enough money in your account. Yeah. And what was that money doing sitting anywhere other than in your trading account? Because there's nowhere else it could be where it would be making more than it's yeah. making in your trading account. You know, you sure. put half a million dollars in the S&P 500, maybe it goes up 10% in, in a year, it's 50 grand. That same 500 grand, you put that whole thing on a $5, you know, stock that goes from five to six, seven to eight, you know, it goes to 10, you're, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars of profit in one day. So, you know, that's where the FOMO starts to kick in of just leave the money there because that's the one day you need it. It's going to pay yeah. for all the days it was just sitting there doing nothing. But what that doesn't take into account is the risk that comes with having it there. Yeah. Yeah, similar story actually is that I actually just took about two thirds of my account out like two or three weeks ago. Um, 
same story as, that, as you is that I didn't want to take it out for a while, even though I knew that the market was slowing down. I knew it was getting choppier. I knew that yeah. it was getting more dangerous for my account. But yeah. I didn't I didn't want to do it just in case there's going to be that one day, that one stock that goes 50, 100, 200 percent. Right. Yeah, definitely. That's just to figure it out and just call it a day and yeah. work with what you got. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's I think it's the right move. Um, I, you know, I think within reason, I I've known some people who have taken money out of their account to, you know, pay taxes or, you know, buy something or whatever. And then they didn't leave themselves enough in the account. And now when things really did start to pick up, they really weren't able to trade as aggressively as they could. So I, I, I don't think it's probably a good idea to drop an account down to like PDT 25,000. No, no, you no, know. no. I think for some traders, 30 to 40, 45 to 50,000 in a PDT, PDT account is, is a good place to leave it. I, yeah. I did that for quite a while. I kind of would grow it up to 100 and then take out 50, grow it up to 100, take out 50. And that sure. kept me in a good kind of you know spot. But then, you know, eventually, as I started feeling comfortable taking more size, I need more buying power. And so I need to leave more money in there. And, um, you know, I, I, so it's, it's just, it's, it's gotta be a personal decision, but that, that was, a, that's a, I'm glad you mentioned that. Cause I think that's a good technique that traders can use when they're feeling they're having a hard time kind of self-regulating. And, and in a way it kind of sometimes can go back to like the basics of like a small account challenge, like get in, get green, get out, be disciplined, one trade a day. And for some people, trade a rehab. You know, I mean, if you need to do trade or rehab, it, people have to do it from time to time, me included. And it's just an opportunity to press the reset button in a big way to go back to basics. And the, during the first two weeks of trade or rehab, what you're hoping to have are, um, you know, a nice stretch of small green days. And then your emotional, the emotional place you're in two weeks in after, you know, eight or whatever decent small little base hits, you're in such a different place than where you were sort of at the bottom of the hole when you were still losing and you were getting more and more amped up and fueled up. So, yeah, no, that's good. Um, so what, um, so we've talked about high level strategy. We talked a little bit about some of the nitty gritty stuff with routing and your broker. Um, the, the, the turning point, um, I guess, it, so I guess one of the things that you did that was really, really valuable was you actually followed the, the good advice of trading a simulator. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Simulator for as long as I could. Um, good. There was times that I wanted to put the money in a lot sooner than I mm -hmm. um, actually did. I mean, months sooner, but I mm -hmm. stuck it out and just made sure that I knew what I was doing through hot, right. through, through cold. Right. Well, um, listen, guys, I'm, you know, I, I'm never going to tell you for those listening that trading is easy because it's not. Trading is hard, and I'm sure Max would agree, right? Trading is hard. Oh, absolutely. You set the right foundation by trading in a simulator. If you had traded with real money and made money, okay, that would have been great. But if you had traded and lost money, what you would have done is you would have started your trading career from an emotionally fueled place of loss. Then desperation kicks in, then frustration, then impulsivity. And next thing you know, you can start spiraling digging the hole deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, and then boom, you're out of the market and you're a statistic of a failed trader. That's what happens when you start with real money and you're not lucky. The people who start with real money and get lucky, you know, the small handful and just take off and go, that's great. But the fact is they were taking this risk that if it went badly for them, they were losing, th that, that was it. That it, it almost guarantees that you're gonna fail. By starting in a simulator, it's okay to lose because the emotions don't get that high. You're able to build experience. And then you have six months, eight months, almost a year in the simulator, whatever it is, eight months, 10 months in the simulator. And now you have all of that historical data that is giving you the confidence when you start trading real money that you actually know what you're doing. Yep. And then when you start with real money, if you do lose a little bit, you have this big reinforcement, this confidence booster that you can still look back on. And this is what I've done. So, okay, the first month, first month I lost a little bit, but this is what I've done. I know what I'm doing. Stick with a plan, stay focused. And it just is such a different emotional perspective. And you know, a big part of success in trading is the mental game. And so you started, you laid the foundation the right way. You know, I mean, there's gonna be people that lay the foundation the right way and they don't succeed. And, you know, I, I think this, this speaks a little bit to aptitude. So what is it about you and me? What is it about us that 
we have the aptitude to be a successful trader. So how many words per minute do you think you can type? Are you pretty fast on the computer? No, not really. No, my God. So what is it? Are you good? I mean, what is it that sort of has made you good at, you obviously have to make quick decisions. Sure. Um, that's a good question. I don't know. I, I've always grown up playing sports and just thinking about sports and just one loss isn't going to set you back a whole season. It's just about moving on from that loss and continuing forward, really. It's just, I think it, it's very similar to sports in that sense where you just, you, get, you have to move on. You're not going to succeed if you don't move on. Um, it's about going to the next day and flushing the last day. It's a lot harder said than done, um, or a lot easier said than done, but it's definitely all mental is just thinking about moving on to the next, it's the next trade. It's the, you can't dwell on the past if you already lost. You, you can't change that. It's really just about going to the next trade, the next day, whatever mm -hmm. it might be, focusing on each day or each week, whatever, each month it might be. Um, just focus on being successful for those certain time frames, really. Hmm. Interesting. Well, I think that from the emotional aptitude standpoint, you definitely are coming in as a pretty, you seem like a pretty level-headed person. And it seems like your approach to trading from the sort of mental side is very centered, yeah. which not everyone is able to achieve. So that's, a, that's an aptitude that you have, uh, emotional intelligence or whatever you might call it, that you naturally seem to have. Um, but there are some physical aptitudes, uh, mechanical aptitudes, like being able to use a computer, being able to use trading software, being able to have hand-eye coordination to press the keys when you're seeing something on the chart moving, which right. you clearly have. You could discount it, but you, you definitely have it because otherwise you sure. wouldn't be able to trade as quickly as you do. And one, one minute long trades is definitely very rapid decision making and ability definitely. to get in see what's happening get out are you using um using a laptop or a, a mouse and a keyboard um i'm on laptop but i do have a 35 inch monitor that i hook it up to with another portable monitor on the side of it too um, okay sometimes when i'm traveling i'll have two of those portable monitors similar to your setup too when you travel yep but for the most part so, it'll just be one screen so you use the laptop do you use trackpad and, and the Right on the laptop. No, no, no. I tried that like you did, but I just yeah, I can't get used to it. I'll have a mouse and a keyboard hooked up to it. I'll have a okay. laptop closed, kind of behind my desk or on the, on the side of it. But got it. It'll okay. be a, it, basically a desktop setup, but in a laptop powering it. What were you doing before you got into trading? Did you have a career or a um, study? For I was something? actually in college, so I'm I'm only 22 right now. So um, I had just graduated college um, in February, so I'm I'm fortunate enough to be where I'm at with trading career and not having to find a job and hopefully never will have to find a job. That's, that's the main goal. I don't want to be in the office, but making over a million dollars trading by the age of 22, it's phenomenal. You are, I mean, you're, you're, you're years ahead. I hadn't even started day trading full time when I was 22. I mean, I had dabbled in the market, but I wasn't full time when I was 22. You are years ahead of where I was. And I mm -hmm. hope that that means by the time you're my age, you'll be, years ahead of where I am today. I mean, I'm honestly, so. it, those it's are some not big. Sorry, not, those are some big shoes to fill, Ross. I mean, you're, what you've done, your strategy clearly works. I mean, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll throw the disclaimer out there, but you know, our, our um, I guess, success isn't normal, yeah. but it's super cool just to, your strategy really does work and you've proven that. Thank um, you. Our, well, our you know, statistics I'm, have proven it. I'm 37 years old and I have met 10 million right now in, in gross profit. You're at, yeah. you're at a million and you're 22 and you did that pretty quick. So you've got, you know, the next 15 years until you're 37, even if you don't even have to average a million dollars a year to be over 10 million by 37, uh, you are tr tracking for that. Certainly. I mean, you know, it's always, there's no sense in putting a, putting out a goalpost so far away. It's sure. not, not really that big of a deal either way, but, um, but you've, you've got something that's working. And you know the thing that I always encourage people is if you find something that's working, double down on it. Just go all in on it, don't give up. Focus as much as you can on it and it, within your strategy. And if there's aspects of your trading that aren't going well, set them on the side 
leave them alone. Focus on what's working. Don't obsess about what's not working. Don't obsess about your losses. Focus on your winners, what you're doing right on those winners, and how to make those types of trades happen more and more frequently and with bigger size. That's how you scale it. So I'm, I'm so excited to see um, you know, how you do in the, the coming years. So what, what's, um, what are a couple pieces of um, advice that you would give to someone who came up to you and said, hey, I, I want to learn how to um, day trade? What if your um, grandma Millie came up and said, Max, I'd like to learn how to day trade. What would you tell her? Uh, well, other than the fact that you, hey, you should look up warrior trading on YouTube or anything like that that I did, right. um, I'd probably just say don't let don't let the losses get to you. Um, it's really just about moving on from that. Again, I'm, I know I know I've hit on it a lot through this um, interview, but really just moving on from the losses is super important too, and just stick with it and stick with your strategy. Don't it, it, like you said too. If something worked out for you, like the small caps would work out for me, mm -hmm. um, and if large caps don't work out for you, there's no point in going there, even if the small caps are slow. If large caps don't work out for you, don't don't risk it. It's not worth it. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Yeah, I, I you know usually I, I have so many people you know of course that know that I trade and everything that will mm -hmm. come up to me and ask me um, you know how to get started and it's not uncommon for me to sort of look at someone and, and think to myself that this is probably not a good fit for you. And I think that it's, I, I, you know, it's, it's often like, I don't think that you are going to be good enough on the computer. I don't think you maybe are going to really be quick enough. I, I don't think, I think that the learning curve is just too steep. There's just too much that you need to learn. And this, you know, this is sometimes on, um, you know, a family member or a friend that'll come up to me that's on the older side. And I'm thinking, I, I want to just, I want to talk you out of trading because this is yeah. not easy and yeah. it didn't happen overnight for me. This isn't like, oh, I can pick up trading, you know, for an hour a day in retirement and start making an extra, you know, six figures a year. It's yeah. not like that. If it were yeah. like that, everyone who's retired would do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some people who are retired who it works for, but, it, you know, it's because they probably already came to the table with a certain set of aptitudes that made them more likely to be successful. And, yeah. you know, a whole bunch of variables that just were in their favor. So, you know, but but then on the other hand, there are people that I'll meet and they're sharp, they're quick. You could tell just the way you're talking with them that they're they're very sharp people. And yeah. those are the type of people that I look at and, and pretty quickly I can think, you should at least try it. Yeah. And maybe it yeah. won't work, but but you seem like you're firing on all cylinders and you're at a place where you have the mechanical aptitude it seems like you've got the emotional aptitude you should try it but do it in a safe way practice in a simulator you know do all the right things that way if it doesn't work out it's like no harm no foul you know you didn't lose a ton but um but you know that's it's something and i don't know if you notice that with you know friends or family that you could kind of look at them and get a sense of like this wouldn't work for you um oh absolutely or there's, this... there's certain times too where people you can kind of tell just don't value money the same way or it's just kind of different, like financial, um, I guess, beliefs, really. But mm. kind of look at them and say, oh, hey, can I try it out? And just, you can, but I don't really recommend it just for, you know, I just mm -hmm. don't think that a lot of those that, that kind of value money or even for the same, um, I guess, sentence too. It's just if you think about money or like what you're losing in a trade that you lose on, um, it's probably that takes a little while to get over to. Say you lose $300, like, oh, that's my bills for the month. Um, it, it's, you know, it's pretty hard to get over that, but. It's definitely important to get over that though too just to realize that it's you're running a business really and losses are going to happen yeah that's that's such an important thing the relationship you have with the gains and the losses um and it's something that's you know it's it's hard because it's not it's not natural to become that detached to money yeah. most people you know the thought of losing even if they have a lot of money the thought of losing you know pressing two buttons and all of a sudden losing seven hundred dollars or a thousand dollars or ten thousand is like horrible gut-wrenching i just i can't possibly and that's you know i i it, i get that i totally get people that come from that the standpoint and, and you know they can either try to condition themselves to become comfortable with it or they can just eventually say this is just it's so against my nature to be okay with this but yeah yeah that's i think that for me 
growing up a little bit in sort of this culture of like gaming, computer games and stuff like that, the gamification of trading in a way that it's just sort of like, you know, I, I don't have like, if I had the amount of money stacked up that I started each day with, and then I had to like give that many thousands of dollars back to the market, like if it was that, if it felt that real, yeah. that would be a lot harder for me. Oh, but definitely. it's not like that you know it's there's a number on the screen and i often don't even look at what my account balance is and so i'm able just to focus on the chart patterns and the level two and, and kind of it, it it feels in a way um you know that trading is kind of like a video game and 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 that's the thing is it's kind of like a fun puzzle for me it's trying yeah. to solve the puzzle better and that's that competition that there's other people out there kind of playing the same game and trying to trade as well as they can and it's fun. It's enjoyable. So I don't know. I think that some people can approach it that way. And I don't know that that is the way all traders look at it. But, um, you know, that that seems like one approach that's helped make it feel less uh, emotional when, you know, there's ups and downs. Yeah, I totally agree. It, it definitely does start to feel like a video game, too. And I think that is something that helped me actually get over my emotions and taking losses, too. Um, you know, I mean, there's a PlayStation right next to my computer, but it's like, I don't know, it's just, it's, it's funny. I'm not really sure which one I'm playing sometimes, obviously, but yeah, it's definitely important how to think of it as a video game, almost in a way, but yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you can't lose sight of the fact that you're taking real trades. There's real risk involved. And, you know, if you get crazy, you can, you know, you, you can lose a lot of real money. Oh, so, yeah, you know, definitely. obviously there's, you know, uh, sure. there's a line there, but but I think with most people falling on the, the side of the line where they're paralyzed by fear that they can't trade, I think that that's the more common experience. And, um, you know, everyone always says trading is, you know, this is a high risk behavior. It's a high risk activity. You know, this is something that adrenaline junkies or, you know, men who like to jump off skyscrapers would do, you know, like free, free jumping or something, mm -hmm. um, base jumping. I don't know, whatever you call it. Free basing. I don't know. I'm, I'm not good with my, my, uh, <laughs> adrenaline activities but sure uh you know i i think there is there's certainly something to be said for the demographics that there's a lot more men that are traders than women and mm -hmm. you know they say it's anecdotally i mean this is what people say it's because it's such a high risk activity women are smarter and they don't do it yeah. they don't engage in it and you know sure there's logic to that because a lot of people lose money uh, but uh you know, having that willingness and ability to take risk. Yeah, it, it takes a special kind of personality. So I think a lot of people want the profits, but if the personality doesn't fit and the mindset's not there and all the men, the physical and mechanical aptitudes aren't there, the profits won't follow. So there's gotta be a lot of things kind of pointing in the right direction. And the only way you yeah. really ultimately know is by practicing in a simulator. So it gets back to that. That's just the best way to start. I definitely so. agree. That's good advice for people. All right. Well, um, this has been great. And, you know, you're, of course, you know, in the warrior community, you've got your million dollar badge and I see you typing every day. And I, I always look really closely at all the traders that have those big badges, you know, million dollars, 500K, whatever. So I, I, I pay close attention to you in the community. I'm, I'm always happy to see your ideas and see what you're looking at. And, you know, for me, it's reaffirming if, you know, you say, so, you're like, oh, I don't know, that looks a little risky. I'm like, OK, double check yourself, you know. Yeah. He, he's on a very similar page as me, the way he trades. Double check your bias. Or if yeah. you're like, I like this and I'm not liking it, I'm like, well, okay, what does he like about it? So that's the yeah. value of, of, you know, you being there with with your badge. So thank you for being in the community. Really appreciate well, it. Same, team, same can be said for you though, too. I mean, there are certain times that I'm in a trade where you say you don't like it. And I'm like, oh, he's right. That's a big topping tail in the five minute. And I don't like that. So yeah, same thing for you. But, but thank you though, Ross. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. So I'll end this recording. Um, so thank you guys who have tuned in and have watched. I hope you learned something and uh, you can join us for the next interview. We've got, um, of course, many of you already have seen all the interviews we've done with traders who have had badges, but uh, you go check out one of the old ones or check out one of the next ones uh, coming up. All right. Thanks, guys. 
All right. Well, if you listen to this entire episode, I hope you'll give it a rating. Hit the thumbs up if you're watching it on YouTube and make sure you check out the all-star traders page over at Warrior Trading. Again, it's a blog that I wrote after interviewing a number of traders who had either hit 100K, 500K or a million dollars in trading profits. And one of the things that I've learned is that a lot of these profitable traders have a lot of things in common. So if you are not yet a profitable trader, it is super valuable to try to get yourself into the headspace and the mindset of what it is to be profitable and what those profitable traders all have in common that you may not have yet. So check out that page and I'll see you for the next episode right here.